You're going to hear so many people get up and say what a unique opportunity this, these three days are. Well, um, I'm another one. It's amazing to see this room, how packed it is, full of people who I'm guessing very few get paid, volunteers who are so passionate about this sport. Um, you know, Tom, it's a great idea to get, to get people to tell stories um, or, or to set a prize for the best story. You clearly weren't next to the Mai Tai tent last night because the stories coming out of that place were phenomenal. <laughs> Most X-rated and can never be uh, re-spoken, of course, but they're really good stories. Um, I'm here just to kind of tell a story myself. And, you know, one thing, one thing in, in leading this leadership forum, one thing that I've always realized is you're going to hear 100,000 ideas over the next three days, slightly exaggerated. The key to me, whenever you go to functions like this, is to try to take, I try to take five. I'm a pretty simple guy. Take five ideas that come out of the next few days that you really think you can implement, that you can bring back to where you've come from. You can go to your club, you can go to your organization, and implement five ideas. Because you're gonna be inundated with ideas. And by the way, everybody's gonna tell you their idea is the best, that their idea is right. And the fact is, and what I want to try to prove to you over the next 20, 30 minutes or so, is that every idea is right. In this room, there is such diversity. In our sport, there is such diversity that there is no right answer very often. All these blog posts that people come out and say, gosh darn it, and they bang their head, fist on the table, and they say, this is the way it has to happen, they are wrong. That is the only thing I know, is they are wrong. There are so many different ways to skin this cat, and that's why all you people are here this week. I think I'm, I think I and my brother, um, are, are proof that this sport is absolutely phenomenal and diverse. Because we didn't grow up in any sort of privilege. My dad inherited a uh, home delivery milk business. We, we delivered milk. My dad was literally the milkman. The milkman did do it in my, in my particular case. <laughs> you guys are freaking slow, man. That took so long for you guys to get that going. So this is the four of us. This is our family. My little brother, he's, he's clearly shorter in, in all aspects of life. Um, my dad, Rowan out, this is our 30-footer, uh, Pearson Wanderer 30, that we learned how to sail in. We went cruising every single weekend, which meant about 4 o'clock in the evening on Friday evening, my parents had a huge fight every single week just prior to getting into this dinghy and rowing out to our 30-footer. But this was our life. This was... Every weekend in the summer, this is Tewissett, Rhode Island, um, we rowed out to the mooring, got on the boat, went sailing for two days. And that's how we learned how to sail. This is, this is our story. We didn't go through all these elaborate junior programs and go sail around the world. We towed a sunfish. We had, we had a sunfish named Bobby Hull and a dinghy named Bobby Orr, <laughs> which gives you an idea of what we did during the winter months. Um, <laughs> So the sunfish was part of our family as well. They didn't have digital camera. I was trying to find a picture of our sun. This is not our sunfish. I don't think they had color photography back when we had a sunfish. Um, and it wasn't really for me and my brother until, uh, until college that we learned how to sail. And college to me, and it kills me sometimes when I hear people say, maybe college sailing is the problem with, uh, with youth sailing today. College sailing to me not only helped me build my sailing career, but helped me structure my life. It taught us how to get to places on time, it taught us how to raise money, it taught us how to organize crews, it taught us how to, how to come up with a budget, and it taught us how to win sailboat races. To me, for me, college sailing was the most important four years of my life. There is no doubt in my mind. So you, you leave college, you move on, you win a couple world championships in, in, a, in a few different classes. You know, I, I've also heard this phrase very often, uh, saving sailing. Well, I think, in my case, sailing saved me. Without this sport, I have no idea what I would be doing. And it, it was because of this sport that just these opportunities kept coming and coming and coming. Now, yes, you might need a hair of talent along the way, but the biggest thing is passion and that there's not a model or a mold that represents the exact way to do it. My brother and I are perfect examples of this. 
So all of a sudden, someday, a guy in San Diego, I mean, it just kept going, it kept going for me. I mean, I just kept tripping over things, and it kept going. All of a sudden, this guy from San Diego calls up and says, you want a skipper in America's Cup boat? I mean, I'm the bloody milkman's son, you know? And, and how does this happen? How did, how did this happen? I kept pinching myself every single day when these opportunities kept coming along. Next thing you know, one of the most respected uh, consumer brands in the world decides to get into the sport of sailing. We're going around the world twice. What the heck? How did this happen? Well, literally, how did this happen? This is not the smartest move ever, but um, <laughs> it, was, it was an experience like you could never imagine until you get yourself into it. The, the management, the organization, the, uh, just the heart, the heart the hardships of it, how, how brutally tough, how, how you can take your body and your mind to a place that you never thought was what you were capable of. It was a phenomenal experience. But again, it just kept rolling. All these things just kept rolling. And because of sailing, again, it's led to even bigger and better things. Gary brought up one, one uh, point earlier. I got to throw in the first pitch at a Red Sox game, which honestly is the coolest thing you could ever do in your life, and it's terrifying. Because, like, to throw a ball to that wall right there, I could hit that painting 99 times out of 100. Put 52,000 people surrounding you, that painting looks like it's two and a half miles away. <clears throat> but it got there, it didn't bounce. Um, things like you meet friends, and all of a sudden you're walking up the, the hallowed fairways of Augusta National. Uh, you're taking your kid around the world, your kid sees opportunity and sees things that no kid could ever imagine seeing what she saw the year, the year and a half that we took her out of school to follow the Volvo race around the world is just, that's just an education of a lifetime. And I owe sailing every single bit of this, every bit, every bit. It's taken me on some pretty cool trips. This is a, a little jaunt we did to a small island called Tristan de Cuna, which is uh, the most remote inhabited island in the middle of the South Atlantic. This is after our mast broke on Puma on leg number one. And a, a quick story here. Uh, yes, we were tourists for five days on this island, actually. Uh, we were waiting for a ship to pick us up to bring us to try to make it to leg number two to start. It was a tragic, obviously, it, it killed our Volvo Ocean Race and any chance we had of winning. But um, it turned out to be one of the most interesting five days I've ever had in my life. And the reason being, I'm sure there's a couple Kiwis in the room, but we have a few Kiwis on our boat. This is just, this is completely, has nothing to do with sailing. I'll just let you know right now. So we had a few Kiwis in the room, and, and the first night we're there, the people who we're staying with say, um, what do you guys want for dinner? You want meat or you want lamb? Well, Kiwis are really fond of lambs. <laughs> um, and see, you guys, seriously, man, you got to step up to just... A little coffee. So, so what do you guys want for dinner? And everybody said, I will have lamb. Lamb. Okay, great, lamb. So about two minutes later, you hear, <laughs> and I've never seen a kiwi cry, but yeah, they shot the lamb. That was dinner. And these kiwis are just bawling their eyes out. That was the cutest little fella. Remember, we had been on a boat for two weeks, so they were eyeing this lamb like you can't even fathom. <laughs> All because of sailing. <laughs> it gave me a fantastic midlife crisis in which I went and bought a Harley Davidson and let my hair grow, thanks to sailing. I have friends that I have gone through things that we will remember for the rest of our lives. I, I get, I, every time I see this photo, I have it on my desk at work, I get choked up knowing what the 10 days prior to this were like. We, we've gotten to sail boats that I mean, nobody ever thought could, uh, these boats, these super yachts right now that we race like dinghies, nobody imagined you could race these things the way we race them now. Uh, ducking, crossing, carbon fiber sails, the loads on these boats, just amazing where this sport is going and how quickly it's getting there. And the best part about sailing, specifically right now, is I'm not doing this. <laughs> I think my brother is. Okay, so I went and did a talk at the World Yacht Race Forum a couple months ago, and I got, a little, I got in a little bit of trouble for, for saying, 
when I put this up on the screen, that the sport of sail sailing has changed forever, or something like that. I firmly believe this. The sport of, of sailing technology has all of a sudden, you know, you kind of ramp through things. You know, technology takes things, and all of a sudden there's a big jump, and then another flat spot, and another big jump. Well, we're certainly in the middle of a jump right now. What we're seeing in the sport is, is different. It's, new. It's, not, it's not new, but it's different. And when you see a laser out foiling, you know that things are, are not the same and, and may never be the same again. Like Gary said, we have 65 mile an hour boats, which is unbelievable. The first boat to sign up for the Volvo Ocean Race, which is in the one designs for the first time, is an all female team. And you heard it here first, this team is not just gonna go sail around the world, not since Don Riley uh, with Maiden won their class, what's that Don? 50, 60, 100 years ago, how long ago was that? <laughs> Sorry, she's going to beat me up after this is over. Um, these guys not only are, are here to race around the world, but these guys are going to be really competitive. And some of people think they can win. They're training so hard. So things are, things are changing. Adventure sailing. Uh, adventure sailing is, is, has taken on a whole new realm. And it's bringing, it's bringing sailing like we've never seen it into our living rooms. Uh, these guys, not only are they sailing around the world, this is Francois Gabar. I met him over in Europe, really good guy, a, a guy that you'd love to pin the sport of sailing on for a number of years to come. He did 535 miles in a day by himself. He said he never left the cockpit and he was sipping coffee most of the day. The boat was completely under control, flying, but he got to, he could, he could, put it, he could put it on video and put it and air it the next day. We were seeing these guys do phenomenal things while it was happening. This is great. Technology is taking us to this place. And of course, we've seen boats fly, and literally boats fly. Um, I know every person in this room at one time or another was a doubter about this event. Um, I think the event itself, it took on a life of its own, clearly. But all of us, I mean, many people in this room, I think you'd call yourself traditionalists. I don't want to see Catamaran's match race. This isn't the America's Cup. Well, guess what? It is the America's Cup. We have to get over it. This is the new America's Cup, and it brought us something that we've never seen before, and it brought us new interested people into our sport. I know there's all kinds of facts and figures as to uh, how many people actually did think about sailing. I was up, I went and bought some fuel right outside of Toronto from my car. And I'm in there and I had an America's Cup shirt on. And I, we had just gotten done and the lady behind the counter said, I watched every single one of those races. I've never sailed a day in my life. That was the most unbelievable thing I'd ever seen. There are so many of these people around you can't fathom. In my travels, I'm sure Gary's travels, all of our travels, this helped our sport. You even met a few people. Gary was so, he was so into his job, he'd go out on the water every single day, that after the racing, he'd hop on the Schooner America and he'd short tack up the left-hand side just to get title uh, information out there. So Gary was a huge part of, of the broadcast, obviously, but I need to thank Gary for kind of taking me under his wing out there and, um, and teaching me how to, how to actually speak on television. So Gary, wherever you are, thank you very much for uh, being my mentor out in California. We sat there, we won it, we had fun. This guy, Todd Harris, everybody kept complaining, this guy, Todd Harris, doesn't know anything about sailing. Well, that was the point. His job was to talk about sailing in such an elementary way that anybody could understand it. Gary and I could tell you guys what a jibe set or what a, you know, what a wind shift was. Todd didn't need to know that stuff. Todd was there to tell you what sailing was like, what the water was like, what the heck these boats looked like in such an elementary way, and he was phenomenal at the job. And I really think that brought a big part to the broadcast. And this, just a, this is kind of blurry, but this is Todd. This is how easy television really is. This is Todd practicing before a, a race. This is our five or six monitors. But if you look really closely, he's watching an old clip of Anchorman to, to, <laughs> just to kind of practice himself up, to, to, to train himself. Actually, that's a good Sandy. That's Ron Burgundy. You, people from San Diego must know Ron Burgundy. <laughs> so that's Todd Harris. That's how professional these TV guys really are. This is my quick uh, America's Cup video, very similar to what Gary showed you, but to show you the quality of what the broadcast did.
So who, whoever would have imagined that, forget it, nobody did. It would be like getting the 64 team draw in the college, for, in, in the college nationals that, that somebody just gave a billion dollars to try to do. But it, you never could have guessed this, right? But this is good for us. I, I firmly believe this is good for us. The Grand Prix part of our sport is not the enemy. The Grand Prix part brings new viewers, new faces, new eyeballs, new people into our sport, and it helps all of us. I'm an eternal optimist, and I think, I've been in this business for a long time, in the sailing business, and I, I see enthusiasm right now, and I see enthusiasm in the marketplace like I don't ever remember seeing. For sure, the economy helping a little bit, up until the last week maybe, but for sure the economy turning around is definitely a big help for all of us in, in this room. But I'm an optimist. Just the fact that Charlie Enright got an American ball boat team last week is such a great thing for sailing in this sport. This is at the Grand Prix level. This doesn't affect very many people in this room. There's a stopover coming to Newport, Rhode Island, but this helps, th I, I think it's projects like this does help everybody in this room. You may never touch this boat, but it will touch you in one form or fashion. We see athletes now in our sport like we've never seen athletes before. On the America's Cup boats in the past, it's always been traditional that, that kind of the, the experience was the thing that got you on the boat. And I think I, when I did my last cup, the average age on our boat was like 45 years old, 44 years old or something. And it's experience. And now the average age, I believe, on Oracle was 29 years old this past time, and these guys were fit. They were unbelievably fit. Athletes are taking over our sport like we've never seen before, kind of similar to golf in a way. Athletes in the Olympics are like kids we've never seen sail before, and it's only gonna keep evolving. It's fantastic, it's good for our sport, it brings a momentum and enthusiasm that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Classes like the J70, I mean, I, Listen, there's all kinds of uh, people here from all different to uh, sorts of manufacturers, but the J70 is yet another phenomenal case that it's just, it's just started this groundswell of people wanting to go sailing higher performance boats. These are people that haven't sailed high performance boats very often. Um, you know, especially you look at the bottom half of the fleet, this is a new thing. Planing in a, in a boat? Maybe not since they were kids did they ever plane. 
So it's, it's, it's things like the J70, it's classes like this that are great for all of us. I went and bought a boat last year. I haven't bought a sailboat in a long time. I'm smart enough to sail on other people's boats, but I went and bought a boat. And I bought a boat because I had fun going out on a Sunday afternoon and going sailing for the first time since I can remember. And we have five of these, we have eight or nine, I think nine of them down in Miami right now for a midwinter series, the M32 class. But I just decided I want a fun, fast boat that my kids, my daughter, and my nephew and niece would want to come sailing with me. And sure enough, they did. <clears throat> Who ever thought we'd see something like the moth class? Again, these aren't things that may touch every single person in this room, but they touch you in one form or fashion. In super yacht racing, I mean, I'm going to super yacht events right now where we get 40, 50 boats out there. We're racing these things. We had five J boats on the starting line this past year in St. Bart's for the first time since 1937. And these are incredible machines that are just wonderful for our sport. There are more new builds, and more, or more brand new builds going on right now than I can remember. Uh, again, I've, I've left plenty of logos off here and I apologize in advance and please don't send me hate mail, but the point is that there's good stuff going on right now. There's lots of new builds going on and that's great. The industry and the people who use, and the users, and you guys for the most part represent the users it, it, we're all on the same page. So often you hear about the industry being the enemy. The industry is here to try to make things better. And there's no doubt about it that the industry is now utilizing technology like it's never seen before. In the United States, yes, in the United States, there's two new builds going on, a 90 and 100 foot monohull offshore record-breaking machines in the Northeast US. They're gonna be launched sometime later this summer. In the United States, so all of a sudden, the super maxis are coming back, and all of a sudden, the United States is starting to lead the way. We're not relying on Europe or Australia to lead the way when it comes to some of these new potential record breakers. And you'll hear more about uh, specifically one of these boats uh, in the next day or so. So how does this all start? And, and I, I'm on the stage, so I get to make my point right now, sorry. But I find it amazing that the biggest sail trainer in this country is still the Optimist, and it was designed in 1947. That would be like me growing up with a beetle cat or something like that, you know? There's nothing against the optimist class. I'm sure there's a, tons of supporters sitting there going, hey, don't pick on the optimist class. But I, I'm not, and by the way, and remember what I said at the beginning, there's no one right way to do things. I just find it amazing that kids today are coming out with all this new technology and we're still training them with square bows. I trained in a 420. This is the boat that I grew up sailing. Again, designed in 1959. I grew up in this boat. Matter of fact, the boat I grew up training in was actually faster than this boat because it, was, it wasn't a collegiate 420, it was an international 420 with tapered mass and a lighter boat, different foils. So I actually trained in a higher tech boat than a lot of the double-handed kids are training in this country now. Now again, I'm not, at least this is get, these are getting people on the water. That is, the, that is the bottom line, but it has to be considered, especially for you local yacht clubs, it has to be considered, are, are we breaking into the modern ages? Are we keeping kids involved because we're showing them the best and the coolest and the latest? You know, the, the 29er class is pretty cool, and I know nothing about the 29er class, but it's got color, it's got speed, it's got little wings. I mean, it's just, it just looks fast. It, it's got bowsprit. I mean, I don't, I don't remember the last time I used a spinnaker pole on a boat. So, I mean, th these are things that have to be considered, in, in especially in your, local, in your local areas. Empowerment, you know, kids getting out there and taking care of their own boats, what a concept. Keeping girls in the sport, you know, we're, we're just, we lose girls as soon as college racing is over. Here, here this, I thought this was a phenomenal couple of photos here. Th this was, uh, you know, square top, high tech, racing dinghies out on the race course doing what they call the heavy weather slalom. It was actually on TV, it was TV all over San Francisco showing these little kids zipping around right next to Oracle out on the race course. I don't know, I, I don't know about you, but I kind of thought I was looking at the future of, of, what, of how we were training our kids. A bunch of small catamarans all of a sudden with the inclusion of high speed uh, catamarans in the Olympics. Uh, you know, uh, kind of a development from the tornado class. My, my nephew, Brendan, wouldn't get off of this boat this past summer in, out in Newport Harbor. Again, 
Empowerment, entitlement, speed, color, getting color into the sport, these are all things that I think these kids are attracted to and, it, and it's gonna get them to come in. Not only that, but it's gonna help us build our Olympic team into the future. Josh Adams, Charlie McKee, all these people are working their tails off to try to kind of change the momentum of, the, of our Olympic team. And the first things first is we're gonna to have to get kids into higher performance boats at earlier ages. These, and by the way, these new, these new Olympic machines are high tech and they're really fast. And you just, you know what? You get off these boats at the end of the day and the whole reason any of us do this is for fun. You get off these boats at the end of the day and you got a smile on your face. And that, to me, is what it's really all about. Don't forget little events like the America's Cup, uh, like the Youth America's Cup, uh, Red Bull Youth America's Cup, kind of <laughs> runs off your tongue. Um, <clears throat> this was an amazing event, and these kids were serious. The two American teams were dead serious. They were fit, they were trained, they were into it. It was really, it was great to see, and you, again, you kind of thought you were looking at the future. Uh, after, after the multi-hulls came to town, I couldn't get my daughter and my nephew off of this boat this summer. I couldn't leave the morning without one of those on. Now, my daughter realized that there's really cute boys in the sport of sailing, which is one of the reasons that she really started to like the boat. <clears throat> one other quick thing about youth, and we always talk about keeping youth into the sport. Uh, after college, I was, we had lunch with Jeff Johnstone the other day, and he was telling me about this program, about how uh, he's trying to step youth into big boat racing. One of the biggest complaints I hear from clients all the time is, I love sailing my boat, but it's such a pain in the neck to get crew. Well, guess what? Your junior program at, at your yacht club is full of crew. Full of them. And they all want to go sailing. Get them out on board. Storm Trisle Club does this fantastic event called the uh, Intercollegiate Regatta. All big boats. All, and the other amazing part about this stuff is it's still co-ed. We're not dragging the girls right out of the sport as soon as, they get, as soon as they graduate. We're not putting them in dinghies that they can't physically compete in because they're not big, big enough. So the big boat part of this has to be addressed. It is a way to get kids, and like Gary said before, kids who probably can't afford to, to buy their own boat right out of college, but get them on your boats. Get them on other boats in the area. Start, like Jeff has done in, in Newport, start a training program that allows you to get kids on the water on bigger boats. It's a way to keep them involved in the sport, and it's an easy way to get them involved in the sport. And then finally, the community sailing programs, I'm very close to this because uh, my brother Brad has, has done an unbelievably good job uh, with Sail Newport, so I'm quite close to Sail Newport. What they've done, the fleet of boats that they just uh, built, not only is it used to get people, uh, locals, novices, adults, kids into the sport, but yacht clubs are starting to utilize the, these community programs now. Yacht clubs, instead of going out and having to buy their own fleet, like, like the New York Yacht Club right across the bay, has a fleet of sonars. Well, not everybody can have a fleet of sonars, so why not go and utilize the community setting, uh, sailing um, center in the, in the fleet of boats they have with your yacht club? Keeping people involved, finding reasons to go sailing, and finding ways to have fun. I was down in Martin County, down in Florida, last weekend, and, and I stumbled across this, a fleet of Hobie waves out there. Th there were, f f I think, four Hobie waves going off the beach when I was there. It was a nice little breeze. The average age, I swear, on board the, each of these Hobie waves was about 146 years old. <laughs> and these people were having so much fun, and that, that's all it was about. It wasn't a race. It wasn't anything. They just had, there was a fleet of boats available. They looked cool. They were fun, they were fast, and these people were having a blast. I just kept thinking, all right, this is what this is all about. So, I have one more quick video, and again, this is just on the community side. This isn't a PR campaign for my brother, but this is something, I think Sail Newport has really, you know, Sail Newport, Oakley, uh, there's all kinds of different uh, community sailing centers that are here in this room. I think you're doing a phenomenal job. This is just a highlight video of what I think has gone great in Newport.
live public access to sailing. That no matter what your background, no matter where you come from, you can go sailing and it doesn't cost you a lot. Seen as a rich person's sport, but we're knocking that down. We offer financial aid packages. We offer free programming to a lot of different area organizations and institutions. So you do not have to have a ton of money to enjoy this sport. Any given day uh, here at Sail Newport, you can see America's Cup veterans, Volvo Ocean Race veterans, professional sailors using the facility, as well as a family bringing their kid for a first time experience. The youth program alone were nearly a thousand children going through sailing lessons a summer. These kids are put in a boat single handing and they are having to navigate from point A to point B. And that has its own challenges and it leads to something that is the most important value that they can get out of sailing and that's self-esteem. Because when you conquer being able to navigate a boat across this harbor to go from here to Kings Park, it's a self-esteem building moment. And I think that's one of the most important things that we offer. The lessons of sailing basically mirror the lessons of life. When you decide you're going to go sailing, you need to prepare, you need to plan, and you need to execute. In sailing, I don't think there's ever any losers because you're on the water, you're with your friends, and you're in the elements, and you're enjoying the water. We were founded in 1983 after the loss of the America's Cup to bring back international sailing to Newport. And Sail Newport has been one steadying factor on public access that will not go away. We need to invest in Sail Newport, and we need to do that so that we can secure public access for the future, not for 20 years, not for 40 years, but for 100 years. Growing Sail Newport is far more of a rush than winning a championship. That championship lasts till the next time that championship ends. This lasts forever. Okay, I just, I just learned something. To get people to concentrate, have the people in the back of the room turn the volume way down. <laughs> that's, that's actually a nice, nice move back there, Jeff. Well done. All right, and finally on to, and this is not last but not least, but not, now on to the yacht clubs. I had lunch yesterday at the San Diego Yacht Club with my friend Vince Brune, and I know you're not, please don't turn me in because you're not supposed to use your phone so you're, or take pictures inside the club, but I did. I broke about 15 rules that day and this is the first one. Um, but I thought this mission statement summed up exactly what I think yacht clubs, uh, uh, what you want to do, what you're striving to do. And it, it, especially all aspects of yachting. It's not about racing, it's not about dinghies, it's not about big boats, it's not about anything specific. It's about all aspects of yachting. And I just thought, and, and the other phenomenal part of this was that this is, this is actually a photo of the Commodore's, this is the flagship, a Naples Sabbat. Usually most flagships you see, it's some like Berger 300 foot thing or a Hinkley 900. Um, th this, is, this is the flagship of the San Diego Yacht Club and I just thought it told a terrific story about what this club is all about. It doesn't matter what kind of fleet you have. Yes, yes, I have talked about technology. And yes, that might be something you, you come away from this talk. You know, this guy just harped on all these cool new Grand Prix things. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have a Rhodes 19 fleet, uh, the, the iconic Catalina 37s up the road in, um, in Long Beach. I mean, these are still, this is an amazing fleet of boats that gets people out sailing. It gets, it gets the yacht club members out sailing. And again, if, you're, if your yacht club doesn't have, can't house, can't moor a fleet of your own boats, tag along with other yacht clubs, tag along with other community boating centers, use their boats, give people reasons to go sailing and to smile. And last but not least, a few little things that I think we need to do with our sport to get people to smile more often. First of all, stop this hiking madness. This is the dumbest thing ever. All these poor people are doing are trying to kiss their own feet goodbye because they're not going to feel them. They're going to be numb for the next, oh, day and a half. This is ridiculous. Stop it. The people who write the sports, we can't be hiking like this. It's no fun. Nobody wants to do it. 
in your local, this is, I mean, are these guys all throwing up in unison or are they being told to do this? But the other, the other astounding part of these pictures is, do you really need 24 people on a 68 foot boat? And the answer is no. So go to your local, local clubs or local communities and cut and actually create some sort of reason to cut the amount of people that have to be on a sailboat to go racing, cut it by 20%. IRC, ORR, HPR, everybody, cut it by 20%. Because again, the biggest complaint I hear from boat owners is, I would use my boat more often. More boats would go out on the water and race if it was easier to find crew. Utilize your kids, utilize the junior programs, but let's consider chopping down the amazing number of t-shirts you have to buy, food, hotel rooms, plane flights, phone calls, just to get all these people on board. We don't need them. The boats sail very easily without them. You don't have to sail all day. If it's an overnight race, then sail overnight. But it, to do a regatta, you do not have to leave the dock at eight in the morning and come in at seven o'clock at night. That is not fun. I hate to tell you, I hate to say to people uh, organizing regattas, we don't have to be out there all day. Let, let's enjoy it more, let's have fun more. There's fun stuff to do and set up a volleyball court on the beach, it doesn't matter. But we don't have to beat ourselves up and call it fun. Simple little things. I wrote an article about this and I got hate mail for weeks. Boats, sit, boats are so much more fun when you point to point race and you take the sails out from down below. Smelly, stinky sails all down below. It, it's not fun. Throw them up on the rail, it blocks the spray. A couple little tie downs, you sit on them. You don't need as many crew because you got weight up on the rail. Allow stacking of sails on the side of boats when you do point to point racing. For sure not around the buoys, but when you're going offshore, allow sail stacking. It's so, I, I went around the world two and a half times stacking sails. It is so much better uh, to be on board a boat that you're not crawling over wet, smelly sails all the time. And a couple that are near and dear to my heart, I don't know about you, but I am so tired of doing windward lured races. <laughs> I actually sailed around the world twice to avoid a freaking windward lured race. That's how, that's how committed I am to this, this specific subject. <clears throat> Listen, I, I, think it's real, I think it's simple. Point to point racing is making a great comeback. Sailing around islands, sailing, sailing to another destination, staying overnight on your boat. It's the little things that I grew up with, that we all grew up with, that I think we're really losing sight of. Going to a regatta and doing windward lured races all day long is just, I think it's starting to, to, to play its course a little bit. And then finally, put the, pro, put the postponement flag away. If the starting lines are 15 degrees skewed, who cares? Don't, we, our, our lives are so consumed with saving time. Why are we postponing it? Why are we, oh my God, the, the weather mark is, is three degrees off of perfect. Who cares? I tell you what, the best sailor is still gonna win the race. If you can't cross the starting line on starboard, okay, it can only cross it on port, well guess what, the best sailor is still gonna win that race. It doesn't matter. Take the postponement flag. If you send people on the water, if it's blowing three, send them. If it's blowing 25, send them. If the line is skewed, send them. Stop postponing, stop wasting time. Get us back in, get us to the volleyball court. Get Gary to one of his 500 bars. You, I mean, seriously, you got a drinking problem, man. I don't know if anybody's here. 500 bars. Maybe he's not my mentor anymore anyway. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Finally, uh, giving back. This is something that we all have to do. This is something, and I'm gonna end it on this. Um, this is something that every person is clearly here for. This is something that US Sailing has been built on, is, is giving back. Um, myself and our, comp our company, we're trying to take some great strides in how we can give back to sailing and especially to sailboat racing, but it's something that I'm so proud to be part of here with all of you guys because clearly you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe in giving back. Um, listen, this is gonna be a great couple days, but remember, don't try to do it all. Don't try to write it all down, but try to c come out of here with five or six things that you think you can establish, you can bring back to your clubs, your community sailing, your wherever you've come from, and, and really try to make a difference. Everybody's gonna do it different, and that is good. That diversity is what makes sailing so great. 
But listen, I'm just proud. I'm just proud and very honored to be speaking to this group, this group, and I really enjoy your few days. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Nicely done. Kenny, I couldn't agree with you more on Windward Lourdes. There's only so many you can do in life. As far as the 500 bars, it was iced tea at every single one of them, and there are more efficient ways. <laughs> <laughs> Product of the 60s. It's legal in Colorado. Lake Dillon's flying high. <laughs>